So first we're going to have the Bible study reading uh, from Mark chapter 4 verses 13 through 20 from Dr. Evelyn Higginbotham. honor for me to speak to you as the national president of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. And I am particularly privileged to read and reflect upon the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, verses 13 through 20, which is known as the parable of the soul. Then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sworn or that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, but since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes, because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. I must tell you that in my visit to Charleston, I have seen many beautiful gardens. And because I love the garden, I am conscious of the meaning and the power of this lesson that Jesus teaches. I want to emphasize a key text key phrase in the text, and it is the phrase, because they have no root. And because they have no root, explains Jesus' people like some seeds that are sown in soil that is not nurturing, cannot withstand the conditions that come along and they fall away. So when I see the beautiful gardens in Charleston, the flowers and trees, it is obvious to me that they have been nurtured with special care. Their root structures have taken hold and grown stronger over the many years. And such plants and trees are called perennials because they are able to survive no matter the conditions. Despite winter and summer, despite good weather and bad weather, they continue to grow larger and blossom. As a historian, I'm also conscious of the meaning of this parable because it reflects the history of our people, African American people, and their sustained and nurtured faith over the centuries. Through persecution and the thorny ordeal of slavery, through the sunshining promise of reconstruction, through the chokehold of Jim Crow injustice, and through the rainbow of the civil rights movement, through bad and good times to this very day. And we are the products of our four parents. We are that crop, that crop of the men and women who for generation after generation were rooted in their heritage, rooted in their faith in God, rooted in the belief that all mankind is created equal and endowed by their creator with inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, both right now and in the future. And because our four parents were so rooted, they never lost hope, and they left for us a legacy, and that is the hope that we still live with. Now history teaches about the strength and the courage of the men and women rooted in faith, and their stories continue to inspire us. 
And Frederick Douglass is a good example. He was a great AME follower. He escaped from slavery. And then as a young man, he dedicated his life to the abolition of slavery. And this was truly an uphill battle for him. He began in the 1840s. And he was in this fight against a situation that was condoned by the federal government, was condoned by the president, the Congress, the Supreme Court, all supported slavery. And so the battle for abolition and the battle for racial equality took tested faith. And yet he had that faith. Just to give you one example, in 1857, the Supreme Court, the highest court in the land, rendered a decision in what's called the Dred Scott case. And in that decision, the court said that black people had no rights. Slaves had no rights, free black people had no rights. In fact, the court said they were not citizens of the United States, even though they were born in the United States. And then the culminating statement, blacks have no rights that the white man is bound to respect. Now this is the highest court in the land. There is no appeal after the Supreme Court. And yet Douglas never lost faith. And he appealed to the moral conscience of America in the midst of a very dark and disappointing reality. And this is what Frederick Douglass said. He said, the Supreme Court of the United States is not the only power in this world. It's a very great power. But the Supreme Court of the Almighty is greater. And then he went on to say, that the justice who rendered this decision cannot bail out the ocean, he cannot annihilate the firm old earth, and he cannot make evil good or good evil. And happily for the whole human family, our rights have been defined, declared, and decided in the higher court than the Supreme Court. Now, Douglas had absolutely no idea when or how a miracle would occur. But he never lost hope. And just four years after Douglas's writing that I quoted, the momentous events unfolded at Fort Sumter and brought about the end of slavery. And after the Civil War, African Americans gained their freedom and they gained their rights of citizenship. And they gained the men, anyway, the right to vote. So what a joyous moment this was for Frederick Douglass and for all black people. But Frederick Douglass also realized, and he spoke about this, that not everyone, not everyone who fought the good fight lived to see freedom. And so his remarks, and I'm gonna quote them to you, also make me think of the parable of the sower. He wrote this, he said, the distance between seed time and harvest in the moral world may not be quite so well-defined as clearly and as intelligibly as in the physical world. But there is a seed time and there is a harvest time. And though ages may intervene, ages may intervene such that neither he who plowed nor he who sowed may reap in person, yet the harvest will surely come. And again, we have to be reminded of those who are not with us today and those who we honor today because the harvest will surely come. But he still met with disappointment because not long after the reconstruction years, race relations worsened. And it's hard to believe that a man who went through slavery, freedom, would now at the very end of his life be confronting one of the worst situations in American history. He had to contend with legal Jim Crow, that segregation. He had to contend with racial violence and lynching. He faced a world where black people who had the right to vote by the Constitution were denied the right to vote by state law. And yet, he never lost faith. And he continued to argue rooted in the Bible, that he would, he would fight and contend for the colored people of the United States. Those are his words. Now, he, he gave this talk in 1894. He didn't even have a year to live. He 
died in 1895. He spoke at the Metropolitan AME Church in Washington, D.C. That was his church. And he called this talk Lessons of the Hour. And as he detailed all the horrors, and he actually called it the terror. He said, we are experiencing terror. And yet we continue to have hope. And he said, I quote him, I dare to contend for the colored people of the United States. And in this specific context, when he said contend, he meant to fight for, to uphold, to take up the cause of anti-lynching and violence, racial violence. And once again, Douglas is rooted in the Bible. He's rooted in the book of Jude, the first chapter, the third verse. And in this really kind of analogous story, Jude is writing to the early Christians who are being persecuted. They are being imprisoned and killed, and this is what the biblical text reads. It was needful for me to write to you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And so here was, here was the faith of Frederick Douglass. And he is just an example of the many people who had faith that they implanted in us. And so we are here today to pay homage to them. And I'm also here today to tell you that after 104 years, the seed that was started by Carter G. Woodson, the father of black history, still lives. And it is our mission to tell the story of the struggle of African Americans, their lives, their work, their ideas, their writings, their creative arts. And in that history are the seeds sown by those who went before us. The history of the Emanuel Nine will always be remembered, and historians will tell of their faith and the legacy that they left us to follow. Thank you.